Hi, welcome to the final recorded lecture for the politics of U.S. public policy. Uh, today we're going to be talking about electoral rules, campaign finance, and voting rights, and how they shape American politics, um, but we'll be really interested in how we might change them to make American politics work better. And so throughout, I'll talk about not just what I see the problems as being, but also how they uh, affect American politics in ways that uh, seem to me, and I think to many others, uh, to be destructive. Um, on Wednesday, Lee Drutman is going to join us, and he's recently written a powerful book on uh, political reform, focusing on uh, how to create a multi-party system in the United States and, and making the case that that would be better than our current intensely polarized two-party system. So here's a brief preview of today's lecture. We're going to be starting with the uh, basics of America's electoral rules and uh, and how they differ from the systems that we see in other rich democracies. As you'll see, the structure of our electoral system is really important for understanding some of the problems uh, that uh, have cropped up in the, and become more manifest in the last generation, particularly problems surrounding the drawing of congressional districts and, and the lack of competitiveness of many congressional seats. Uh, after we look at these issues of ge geography, gerrymandering, and representation, uh, we're going to turn to the role of money. I'll start with campaign finance and talk a little bit about the ideas on the table for reforming our campaign finance system. But a big theme of this part of the lecture is that campaign finance is really just the tip of a huge iceberg of money in politics. And in many ways, while the most visible it's not the most important. And it turns out it's a lot harder to deal with the manifestations of money in politics that are beneath the waterline, so to speak, the hidden parts of the iceberg. Then we'll turn to what I consider to be one of the most troubling, if not the most troubling aspect of uh, political dysfunction today, namely the degree to which the fundamental right to vote has been under attack in many states um, because of the perception on the part of partisans that it will give them an advantage. And this is really, let's just be frank, coming from uh, the Republican Party for reasons we'll discuss. And uh, we'll also consider how much of a difference this assault has made uh, and what might be done about it. Uh, and that's where we'll end. So we'll, we'll end the lecture by thinking about um, reform more generally. And I'll set up Lee Drumman's conversation uh, with us on Wednesday. Okay, so I said that the American electoral system was distinctive. Um, this is a global map of electoral systems, and what you'll notice right away is that there's not a lot of red. Um, red is plurality voting of the sort that we have in the United States, which simply means that the, the candidate who gets the most votes uh, in a contest wins, usually a two-candidate contest. So the U.S. is distinctive, and, and most countries have some form of proportional representation. So, so what do we mean by proportional representation? Well, proportional representation is basically a system in which the number of seats that a party gets in an election is roughly proportional uh, to the number of votes that it gets from the electorate. So in other words, it's a, it's a system that's going to require that you have multi-member districts, right? There are hybrid systems, but it's very hard if you have more than two parties, right, to divide up seats across these multiple parties without having multiple members running to represent a specific geographic uh, region. So the main variant of this is, is called party list voting. Um, and this simply means that um, the voters are choosing among parties. The basic idea is that they're choosing the parties and the parties are presenting a slate of candidates, basically a list of candidates. And you go down the list uh, as far as you have to to fill the offices, the seats, based on, uh, on what share of the vote the party gets. I'm not going to go into these other ideas. You can look them up, but there are a number of different ways in which you can do this. What you really have to know is that proportional representation is the norm, and it requires multi-member districts, and it tends to result in the number of seats in government reflecting the number of votes in the electorate. So the U.S. system, as I said, is very different. It's a plurality system, um, and it has... 
a number of other distinctive characteristics. Um, one is that we just have a ton of elections, far more than in most countries, and that is quite uh, burdensome for voters. Um, it might be thought that it's a great thing that you can decide so many different offices, but there's a lot of evidence that when you have a lot of elections and you get a voter fatigue problem, um, particularly when you make it relatively hard for voters uh, to register and vote as we do in the United States. There is also importantly a, a, a prevalence uh, of direct primaries, right? So you've got these two parties say that are competing in the general election, but you have these primary elections that are determining who is on the ballot uh, from each party. Note that when I talked about the party list voting earlier, it was actually the party that was deciding um, who was on its ballot. And so having this primaries, it means you have another level of, of elections. And direct primaries basically date back to the early 20th century in the United States. Um, and for the presidential races, they've become much more important since the 70s. Um, and they have a number of effects that we can talk about. But basically, I just want you to understand that that too is distinctive. The result of having single member districts is that districting becomes absolutely fundamental. And this is um, the really the heart of the issue when it comes to geography and gerrymandering. The system also has, as we know, significant malapportionment. Um, the Senate is the most malapportioned upper body in the rich democratic world. Um, it is um, one that gives the states that are sparsely populated vastly more influence relative to the number of voters in the Senate, uh, because each state gets two senators, than the states that are much more populous. But the main thing I want you to know is that if you have a uh, single member district system where there's one winner representing a region, then the drawing of districts becomes absolutely fundamental, right? So politicians have always known how to gerrymander, and when they've had the power, they've tried to gerrymander. The big thing is that gerrymandering has become a lot easier as voters have become more geographically um, distinct. So in particular, as you can see from this figure I took from Rodden's book, um, the more dense areas are, the more that they tend to vote for Democrats. And that was not true as recently as, as 1960. There was just a very modest Democratic edge. And in 1916, as you can see here, there was literally no relationship at all. So what, why is it that having a, a strong relationship between population density and partisanship matters? Well, it matters because when you have a really strong uh, uh, urban bias in favor of the Democrats, or rural bias in favor of the Republicans, it opens the door to some very efficient gerrymandering, uh, particularly for the Republican Party. So now one result of this geographic sorting is uh, that it's just uh, the case that there are fewer and fewer competitive districts. And this matters a lot because the more competitive districts there are, the more likely it is you're gonna see um, uh, fierce competition between the parties to appeal to voters in every election. The more competitive elections there are too, the more likely you're going to see real s large swings uh, between the parties uh, if the public swings in one direction or another. Now it's really important to understand that this can change, um, that you can see seats that were leaning Democratic or Republican become more competitive in a, in a highly uh, uh, volatile election year like we had in 2018. So there's a major backlash against the Republicans in 2018. And you can see here that uh, Democrats um, really um, uh, sought to go after Republicans and there were very few Republican seats where they didn't field a challenger, right? There's three in this figure. Meanwhile, the Republicans that were, that were back on their heels in that election uh, they did not contest a lot of Democratic held seats. As you can see, 40 seats um, were not contested. But the long term trend has been toward fewer competitive seats. So coming back to the major story, right, this growing sorting of the electorate um, with rural areas trending Republican and 
and urban areas trending uh, uh, democratic has also created these massive opportunities for gerrymandering, particularly for the Republicans. So here's a figure that I think really drives home just how much this matters. So back in 2016, right, Republicans uh, were able to get um, 54 percent of the votes of the state votes, but win 13 of 18 seats after this map was uh, uh, struck down and a new one was drawn in 2018, Republicans got just slightly more uh, uh, seats than votes. Um, they got 45% of votes, but they ended up with uh, half of seats. So, so districting, you can see, really matters. And note that the Republican strategy uh, in 2016 was essentially to concentrate uh, voters in the two most populous areas uh, around Pittsburgh and Philadelphia so that there were a lot of wasted Democratic votes in those areas and they could win outside of these urban centers. So Pennsylvania's map was made more balanced, but North Carolina's 2018 map remained heavily tilted toward Republicans. Look at these results. Um, at the time of this um, map, uh, nine of 13 seats had gone to Republicans, despite them only getting half the U.S. House vote uh, statewide. And you can see again that the urban areas are dark blue, where huge numbers of uh, Democratic votes were essentially wasted with outsized margins for Democratic candidates. Um, you're curious who won in the ninth uh, uh, district where the Republican candidate was leading at the time that this figure was done, well, it was uh, ultimately handed to the Republicans. So they ended up with 10 of 13 seats with 50% of the U.S. House vote statewide. So how do you measure this? Well, one, uh, one metric that has been proposed by a couple of law professors is the so-called efficiency gap. So the efficiency gap is basically a measure of how efficiently each party translates its total votes into seats. To keep this simple, let's just think about a hypothetical state that has five districts. And to make things really simple, let's assume that each of those districts has 100 voters in them. So the number of votes here is the same as the percentage of the vote. So there are five districts. Four of them are won by Republicans by relatively narrow margins. One of them is won by Democrats in a blowout. And as you can see, in that district, they win by such a comfortable margin that 34 of the votes that go to the Democrat are essentially wasted in the sense that there are excess votes that aren't necessary to actually win the seat. So to calculate the efficiency gap, you're basically interested in two kinds of votes. Um, one is the, what I just called wasted votes, right, where you win in a blowout. And that's those 34 Democratic, uh, extra Democratic uh, percentage points in uh, District 5. Um, but the other thing you're concerned about is lost votes, basically places where you don't get to you don't get to a plurality and therefore all of your votes essentially don't translate into a win. So if you add up those on each side, you get basically a um, you get a ratio um, that is called the efficiency gap, right? So you can see here, you're taking all those Republican wasted votes, which are pretty small, um, and adding those to the lost votes, right, where they, they lost in District 5 and they had 15% of the vote. Uh, and then you do the same thing uh, for the Democrats and you get a much bigger number, right? And then it's the difference between those two numbers uh, divided by the total number of uh, uh, votes across the five districts, right? So again, um, you're, you're, you're talking about a gap in the, the efficiency with which each party translates its uh, votes into seats in government. So if you look nationwide, since the 1970s, the efficiency gap grew dramatically up until the 2012 election. Um, and um, we've seen it come down in this last 2018 election, but you can see really that there's a strong bias in favor of Republicans. Um, you can look at this state by state as well. The Associated Press did this um, in a really nice uh, figure. So what they show here is basically um, what the uh, share of the vote 
um, was in each state, um, and then the share of seats. And the share of the vote is that uh, white circle, and the share of seats is that filled circle. And so the distance between them is basically a measure of the efficiency gap. And uh, what's clear right away is that in the most populous states, which elect um, the majority of members of Congress, of course, um, that you've got um, you've got an overwhelming uh, uh, you know number of dis of of maps that are favorable to the Republican Party, um, and it's rare. Um, though not unheard of, to have maps that are in favor of the Democratic Party. Um, and again, this is because the Republican Party is um, much more, dis its voters are much more dispersed geographically. I think the, the, the people who do the best work on this, and, and I was fortunate enough to be at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study as a fellow um, with Moon Dutchen of Tufts University, who's one of the best uh, mathematicians studying redistricting. And she is basically doing these simulation results where you run basically many, 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 many different possible district configurations through a simulation. So what you do here essentially is you take the actual share of the vote but then you come up with a wide range of possible districting plans. And this is actually pretty complicated, right? Because you have to follow certain rules. Districts have to be contiguous. Um, they can't, um, you know, they, they, can't, <laughs> they can't have half the district on one side of the state and the other half on the other side of the state. And there are often other rules that have to be followed about district structure. So basically, you have a algorithm that allows you to come up with a large number of possible districting schemes and then you simulate what the outcomes would have been using the actual votes. Uh, this is uh, Wisconsin State Assembly in 2012 and that little WI down there at the bottom is the actual, um, the actual plan that Wisconsin's um, uh, state legislator produced. So the Republicans essentially produced a map that was so gerrymandered, right, that it's at the very, 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 very far right tail of the possible configuration of maps, right? So there's no way that this could be a result of chance, right? You, you, you can see right away from this that this, this is one of the most gerrymandered possible maps you could come up with. Indeed, according to the, um, to the simulation, it's more extreme than 99.5% of alternatives. So how do we fix this? Um, you know, the problem is basically that with redistricting um, done by partisans who have these, in, uh, in the case of Republicans, this inherent advantage because of the distribution of their voters, uh, you basically have politicians picking voters rather than voters picking politicians. Um, and there are three broad categories of responses that have been um, discussed and implemented. One is independent redistricting, which is actually quite uh, common. As you look here, you can see that um, especially uh, on the West Coast uh, and also some of the, the, the most sparsely populated mountain states, um, you have independent districting commissions. And these states uh, tend to produce maps that are pretty good at representing the share of the electorate that's in one party or the other and that um, result in a larger number of competitive races. Another approach, the one that we sort of were following for a long time was judicial policing, right? So if a map was really uh, extreme, then it could get challenged at state or federal courts. And, um, and then the, the, the courts would basically say, sorry, this is too far outside um, the norm and you need to redraw it. Now, basically that's not a possibility anymore uh, until the Supreme Court shifts for federal uh, districting in the, so so House elections because the Supreme Court in its 2018 decision basically said we can't uh, judge whether maps are are too tilted in one direction or the other and it is the case that there isn't any objective standard you could use you know my own my own thought is that you basically should follow a kind of uh, approach which says that if the districts 
or in the outer tails of those simulations, that is to say that they are really biased relative to other possibilities that you should uh, have them redrawn. But there isn't some kind of rule that you can come up with that would say if you're above um, this level that that somehow more, you know, reaches the level of unfairness where you have to redraw districts. Of course, none of this would be an issue if we just got rid of single member districts. And of course, that's what Lee Drutman says we should do. Uh, so we'll talk with him about that uh, on Wednesday. So the second issue that I want to talk about was campaign finance reform. Um, as you all know, uh, money has become much more important in American politics in the last uh, 25 or 30 years. Uh, it's always been a part of American politics, but the cost of winning House and, and Senate seats has gone dramatically up. At the presidential level, we haven't seen the number rise uh, quite as dramatically. Um, and in fact, 2008 was the, the recent peak in election spending in presidential elections. So the biggest story in campaign finance of the last 15 years has been the 2010 Citizens United ruling. So controversial and high profile was this ruling that President Barack Obama actually chastised the Supreme Court uh, at a, during his State of the Union address. With all due deference to separation of powers, last week the Supreme Court reversed a century of law that I believe will open the floodgates for special interests, including foreign corporations, to spend without limit in our elections. I don't think American elections should be bankrolled by America's most powerful interests, or worse, by foreign entities. They should be decided by the American people. And I'd urge Democrats and Republicans to pass a bill that helps correct. So Obama's words at the 2011 State of the Union address are a reminder that money in politics has inevitably and undeniably become a partisan issue. And one reason for that is that, generally speaking, money in politics has advantaged the Republican Party. Now, showing that in a rigorous way turns out to be relatively hard. Um, but a paper that I had you read that, um, that was um, using Citizens United as a kind of natural experiment shows very clearly that um, states where Citizens United wiped out pre-existing campaign finance laws, these are the treated states uh, in the analysis, um, the ones that are indicated in this figure uh, by the solid line, those states saw both a, an increase in the share of state legislators uh, that, that came from the Rep Republican Party and they saw a shift to the right of legislators. So those figures suggest that one effect of the rising role of money in politics is to shift the playing field in favor of the Republican Party. But take a look at this figure, which just gives you an idea of, of how much money and campaign finance has become the preeminent concern of our elected representatives. This is an actual PowerPoint presentation that was given to incoming freshmen uh, by the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. So what should you be doing, new member of Congress, um, in the time that you have uh, on Capitol Hill? Well, according to this PowerPoint, uh, you should spend an hour doing strategic outreach, uh, a couple hours on the committee or on the floor taking votes. Uh, and yeah, spend an hour or two uh, meeting with your constituents. Meanwhile, head on over to our call center, which of course can't be in Capitol Hill uh, because that's against the law, um, and spend four hours calling uh, to get money. This figure drives home that members of Congress of both parties are just spending enormous amounts of time uh, trying to raise money. And if you're trying to raise huge sums of money uh, for your own campaigns or to contribute to fellow partisans' campaigns, where do you want to call first? Well, it's pretty obvious that the people who are going to most efficiently fund your campaigns are those with lots of money. Um, and 
This is why, as I've said in previous classes, um, it's so important that the wealthiest Americans do not have the same views on many policy issues as do um, you know, Americans more broadly. So, so how do you fix this? Well, there's been a convergence among campaign finance reformers on the idea of matching small donations. And Connecticut has a system like this called the Citizens Election Program. And basically the idea is candidates voluntarily decide to abide by uh, campaign donation limits, and in return they get access to these matching funds. And the idea is basically that you're magnifying the power of small donors while um, limiting the extent to which candidates can draw on big donations. Now, it's worth noting that this isn't the first best solution, but the one that reformers think they could actually get around the Supreme Court's uh, current rulings. Um, whether that's true is up for debate because the Supreme Court has gained more conservative members since 2010. But there is, of course, another approach, which would be to amend the Constitution itself to say basically that uh, campaign uh, donations and spending are not uh, equivalent to free speech. Um, and the important point I want to leave you with is that campaign finance is really only the tip of the iceberg. There's a huge amount of money beneath the waterline, so to speak. Um, there's a wonderful paper on this by Jake Grumbach and my frequent co-author Paul Pearson. And you can see right above the waterline, uh, particularly when you're talking about money spent by corporations, there's PAC spending, political action committee spending. But below that, there's all these other ways in which corporations can influence uh, policy making. And, and they show, for example, that contributions by corporations to intermediate organizations like uh, the Chamber of Commerce or the Governor's Association are much more skewed toward uh, the Republican Party and the right um, than they than are corporate contributions uh, through their political action committees to uh, electoral campaigns. So we turn finally to the issue of voter participation and rights, because voting is a much more equally distributed political resource uh, than money. Um, and voting is kind of the bedrock of the American political system. So one of the most troubling developments of the last generation is the degree to which voting rights have come under renewed assault. Um, a few years ago, when John Legend and the rapper uh, Common received an Oscar award for their, for their musical contribution to the movie Selma, um, Legend declared, Selma is now. By which he meant that the struggle for voting rights was not over, and in fact, we've seen regression uh, of voting rights since the civil rights and voting rights breakthroughs of the 1960s. Since 2011, a string of restrictive voting laws have been passed at the state levels. Uh, these include voter ID laws, um, cutbacks in the number of days of early voting or absentee voting. Uh, and of course, we saw this dramatic example of the reluctance to make it easier to vote in the Wisconsin election that was recently held uh, in the midst of this pandemic. Now, there's an active debate over whether or not these restrictions work. Um, my own take on it is sort of close to common sense, right? Uh, you don't really see people pursuing uh, policies unless they think they're going to have an effect. Um, but, you know, the, the evidence so far is that uh, voter identification laws have relatively modest effects. And there was recently a very heated <laughs> exchange for, at least for political science, uh, in the Journal of Politics about how big these effects were. Um, you know, I think part of the problem is that, um, is that we're focusing very narrowly, right? Um, and, um, and, and so let me just say that the first thing that we know is that voter fraud is not a big problem, right? Uh, and the second thing that we know is that these laws are much more likely in states that are Republican controlled, in states where Republicans are losing uh, standing politically, and states with significant uh, minority populations. And that the groups that are least likely to have IDs are uh, core Democratic voters, lower income voters, though elderly voters tend toward the Republicans, the ones that are least likely to have IDs are those most likely to vote uh, for Democrats uh, and, of course, minority voters. But I think I think it's it's 
it's fair to say that the effects aren't as large as many advocates um, uh, argue. And, and part of that is that we just don't have a great deal of good data. And another thing to say is that American levels of voter turnout are already very low. Um, but I think that there's a problem, uh, really two problems with the way in which people have looked at this. One is that a lot of the restrictions go well beyond voter ID. Voter ID is kind of the lost leader, if you will. And yet all of the research so far is focused very narrowly on voter ID. But the other thing I'd say is that um, after these laws are passed, there's a, a surge in um, in voting by affected populations. Uh, advocates uh, work harder to get them out. People are upset about the restrictions, but that's not a sustainable response. And so that can that could partially offset the negative effect of these uh, restrictions, but it's not it's not necessarily one that we would uh, in, uh, expect to see over the long term. The other thing to say is that um, we've seen a counter move uh, in many states, uh, different states, towards um, a much uh, more streamlined process for registering and voting. Automatic voter registration is the, the, the most important of these developments, but we've also seen, as we saw uh, in our discussion of Florida, that, um, that, that uh, voting rights have been restored to ex-felons, and we've also seen a big, expan big expansion of same-day voter registration uh, early and early voting opportunities, as well as vote by mail. This isn't just an issue at the state levels, it's become a big national political issue as well. Um, the first bill that the new House majority passed in 2019 was H.R. 1, which is essentially a set of political reforms, including campaign finance reform uh, and expanded uh, voting rights. This bill has not, of course, come up in the Senate. In fact, uh, Mitch McConnell has made a point of uh, dismissing it as essentially a democratic power grab. They want citizens to bankroll political materials that they totally disagree with. But they aren't stopping there, Mr. President. Democrats also want taxpayers on the hook for generous new benefits for federal bureaucrats and government employees. Their bill would make Election Day a new paid holiday for government workers and created an additional brand new paid leave benefit for up to six days for any federal bureaucrat who decides they'd like to hang out at the polls during any election. Just what America needs, another paid holiday and a bunch of government workers being paid to go out and work. I assume our folks on, our colleagues on the other side on their campaigns. This is the Democrat plan to restore democracy a brand new week of paid vacation for every federal employee who'd like to hover around while you cast your ballot. A Washington-based taxpayer-subsidized clearinghouse for political campaign funding. A power grab that's smelling more and more like exactly what it is. I want to end with just a few thoughts about how we should think about political reform more broadly. Because the first and most important thing to say is that there just isn't a magic bullet. We have a series of interconnected problems that, um, that are not going to be changed with one big reform, whether it's shifting campaign finance or ending partisan districting or, um, or changing voting rules so it's easier for voters uh, to register and vote. These Reforms need to be understood as as um, as linked together, and that you know small changes are going to have relatively small effects. The problem, of course, is that big changes are really hard. Um, they're really hard for one thing because there are just some structures in our political system that are deeply embedded. So one set of problems comes from the fact that there are just some political structural changes that run afoul of our basic constitutional structure. And that unless we, unless we really fundamentally shifted our system of government, which seems unlikely, we're not gonna see those, those kinds of changes. So one, for example, is the malapportionment of the Senate. The Constitution itself says that no state 
without its consent shall be deprived of equal representation in the Senate. And it's impossible to uh, imagine the states that are less densely populated that get such a representational boost out of this system of apportionment uh, approving such a change. Likewise, we should resist magical thinking, right? That, that somehow this will just, uh, you know, provoke such widespread public revulsion um, that we're going to see this, this, this groundswell of support for change that will drive politicians to support changes in campaign finance and, and voter rules and the way in which we district and a whole host of other uh, necessary reforms. So you need to think about what are the groups that can bring sustained organized pressure for reform and how can you foster uh, long-term advocacy for reform within government? It is, again and again, it is the case that um, it is government elites, um, elected representatives, uh, that ultimately are the brokers who make reform happen. And a final warning, sometimes half a loaf is worth the none. If one side in a partisan conflict unilaterally disarms, um, even if they're doing the right thing, uh, it could lead to an even further imbalance in our political system. Uh, the, the best example of this is shifting away from, uh, from partisan districting. So far, it's been blue states, democratic states, that have adopted reforms. And the result is that their systems are more fairly representing uh, the, the, the share of the electorate that supports the Republican Party within those states. But if you don't see a parallel shift occurring uh, in red states, in Republican states, then essentially the, that half a loaf of reform is actually making the partisan imbalance caused by gerrymandering even worse. So on Wednesday, we're going to be joined by Lee Drutman, and I just wanted to, to lay out his uh, comprehensive reform plan. Drutman is, believes that the fundamental problem is the lack of a true multi-party democracy in the United States. Um, he thinks that this two-party structure we have is, is, is much too polarized, uh, and that what we need to do is move uh, in the direction of more European-style multi-party democracy. And he proposes several different ways to do this. Um, but the most important is that he wants to have ranked choice voting um, in Senate, House, and presidential elections. He'd also like to get rid of the Electoral College uh, and congressional primaries. And he thinks we should increase the size of the House um, to 1,600 members of Congress. Because essentially, congressional districts have gotten bigger and bigger. Their populations are so large now that he thinks that um, they can't be effectively uh, represented. So what he wants to move to is essentially multi-member districts, right, so that you can have uh, more members of Congress, but not necessarily more districts, with each district uh, electing three to five members as opposed to just one. Of course, one big fly in the reform ointment is the Supreme Court. I've already talked about the Citizens United ruling and its precursors and now successors. Um, and I've mentioned um, that the court has basically thrown up its hand and said it will not uh, be involved in, in, in adjudicating uh, district maps. But I should also say that the, the, the Supreme Court and its Shelby County versus Holder decision essentially gutted the Voting Rights Act uh, because it got rid of a process known as pre-clearance uh, that required that certain states clear their um, congressional district maps with the federal government, um, and which a, a lot of research has shown uh, was actually fairly effective in preventing extreme gerrymandering that uh, particularly um, affected uh, African American voters. But it is worth noting that the Supreme Court uh, gives an enormous amount of deference to the states when it comes to the structure of their electoral systems, and that states are completely free to adopt things like ranked choice voting. In fact, Maine already has it. So one route to reform is that uh, the states would uh, take the lead. But one problem with that is that it as I said earlier, when I talked about half a loaf being less than none, uh, these reforms at the state level might take place only in uh, states that are controlled by Democrats and thus not reach uh, a lot of the electorate. Which brings us 
to a final possibility. Maybe we don't worry as much about the Supreme Court and just amend the Constitution. And there are lots of changes that could be pursued through constitutional reform. We could get rid of the Electoral College. We could create a national right to vote. We could state in the Constitution that money doesn't equal speech, um, contrary to the, to the Citizens United logic. Um, yes, Senate apportionment is, is almost certainly beyond our reach, but many of the things that we're talking about could be affected through constitutional amendments. The problem is we've basically seen no serious constitutional amendments since the early 1970s. Um, this is a, a figure that reminds us that we saw an enormous number of constitutional amendments in the past, um, particularly during the progressive era of the early 20th century. Um, and, um, and even as late as the 1960s and 70s, there was a, a, a number of constitutional amendments that were passed. In fact, uh, the last really substantive constitutional amendment was uh, the 26th, which gave 18-year-olds the right to vote. That happened in the year of my birth. Uh, and this is a picture of me, not from 1971, probably from uh, 1976 or 7, uh, that was done by my grandfather, who is a watercolor artist. So I will say no more than that the fact that there's been just one successful constitutional amendment since my birth uh, is suggestive that it's really, really hard to amend the Constitution today, um, given the high levels of polarization, both polarization uh, across uh, members of Congress uh, and polarization across the states. But the founders believed that the Constitution uh, should be amended over time to keep up with changing circumstances. And surely if there's, there's any set of issues that they would have supported uh, constitutional amendments addressing, it's the fundamental issues of voter rights, of representation, and of the ability of citizens to have voice that is heard over the din of money and politics.